You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Hello, and welcome to your subscribers-only bonus episode of Ben Franklin's World. Thank you for being a subscriber. It's wintertime here in the United States, which means colder weather and, in many parts of the country, snow and ice. So it seems like February is the ideal time for us to explore more of what winter meant in colonial British America. Now, in episode 267, we spoke with Thomas Wickman, who's an associate professor of history and American studies at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. Now, Tom joined us to investigate what winter was like in the early American Northeast using details from his book, Snowshoe Country, An Environmental and Cultural History of Winter in the Early American Northeast. During our full-length conversation with Tom, we investigated details about Northeastern winters during the 17th and early 18th centuries, information about how Native American peoples thought about and experienced winter during the 17th and early 18th centuries, and what the English colonists of New England made of winter and its cold and snowy weather. Now, in this follow-up conversation with Tom, we're going to go a bit further in our investigation. We're going to consider whether winters in the early American Northeast were particularly harsh, how weather shaped the religious practices of Native peoples and New England colonists, and how the peoples who lived in 17th and early 18th century New England coped with winter's very short, dark, and cold days. I hope you have a warm beverage in hand, because it's time for us to journey back to New England during the Little Ice Age. Kristen has two questions for you, Tom. First, over the course of your study, did you find any winters in the early American Northeast that were particularly harsh? Kristen wonders whether there were any particularly harsh winters during the early American period you study, and whether those winters impacted colonial and Native American dress, farming, war, and movement. Yes. You know, winter is like the winter of 1642 and the winter of 1698 were noted by colonial writers as being especially cold. They measured that difference in all kinds of ways. In both cases, they consulted with native neighbors. But all you get is a sentence saying is something to the effect that native communities didn't remember or could hardly remember a winter just like this. You know, those statements are, are hard to know what to do with. They're really interesting moments of consultation and communication dialogue about winter weather. But it depends what questions were asked. If it's a simple question about exactly how many snows there had been one year versus previous years, I think that there are probably some lost opportunities of what could be learned about historical perspectives among Wampanoags or Nipmunks or Wabanakis when it came to what was the kind of unstable weather they had become accustomed to over many generations and how they adapted to that. Other ways that English writers kind of measured one winter against another, they counted snowfalls. So in 1698, People estimated between 20 and 30 snowfalls. But I think the biggest marker for colonists of what made a really long winter was how long the snow stayed on the ground without melting. And that's interesting. So particularly cold winters, that could be, and here we're talking about coastal areas where settlers are, that was, you know, four and a half months, pretty long time. But that's a routine expectation of you know, Wabanakis who relocate to interior hunting grounds in the winter time in the 17th century. That's what they want in any winter. And that's a somewhat normal situation of having a snowpack that lasts for months and months. So it kind of depended where you were. Winter conditions varied spatially, if not more, as they varied temporally from year to year. And I think over time, English settlers who became more mobile came to think of things that way too. But certainly that was the case for. Native communities that moved along snow gradients or temperature gradients within their territories. I'll also add that it's tricky whether we want to use a term like harsh for a winter. It's impossible to deny that in a winter like 1698, 
which was at the tail end of the second Anglo-Wabanaki War, that people were suffering. And that's English people and Native people. There are reports of disease, uh, food shortage, and sometimes extremely cold temperatures, no matter how knowledgeable you were, were really hard to bear. There's no doubt about that. But at the same time, the fact that that winter happened at the end of a war that was about a decade long, it affected people whose stores were depleted, whose immunity was worn down. These are communities that are already suffering. And so in peacetime conditions, there's plenty of evidence that Wabanaki people are actually hoping for uh, really snowy long winters, looking for signs of those things. In ecological terms, one of the interesting things that I'm looking at with some of these winters is that they seem to produce winter kill events, which are mass die-offs of particular species that couldn't cope with the conditions. So in 1642 in Maine, there are reports of fish dying from the cold. There are also reports of livestock and livestock were not always well adapted to the conditions, were somewhat dependent on English colonists for fodder. It depends how long their legs were. The snow got really deep and icy on top. It could impact the mobility of livestock who are out far from colonial homes. In 1698, there were reports of not just livestock deaths, but white-tailed deer winter kill. And colonial authorities in New England actually responded by passing conservation laws to try to help the white-tailed deer rebound. That happened after the Great Snow of 1717 as well. So that's an interesting example of a constructive response to preserve white-tailed deer populations. It's not the first effort at conservation. I'm jumping back and forth between these two winters, but if you go back to the early 1640s, the Narragansett Sachem, Miantonomi, called for a kind of a pan-Indian rebellion against the English colonies in southern New England. And in a reported speech that was written down later by Lion Gardner, he cited a number of different forms of ecological degradation that were happening as grounds for the revolt. And a lot of those probably related to the extreme cold that had been experienced in the late 1630s and early 1640s. And that included colonists cutting down the grasses for hay to feed their animals, colonists cutting down trees for fuel and building material, but particularly for fuel. And to some extent, maybe the die-off of white-tailed deer that might have been happening because he did refer to the rebellion as a way to create a kind of the conditions for an ecological rebound among white-tailed deer and other game animals that people in southern New England really cared about. So is that call for conservation? You know, that's, yeah, I suppose so. Different kind of conservation. Now, Kristen, second question. Was there any variation between the winters experienced by Native Americans and Anglo-American colonists who lived in the North American Northeast and the Native Americans and Franco-Americans who lived in the area of New France, which was a bit further north? One of the biggest differences was that the major shipping route to New France, the St. Lawrence River, routinely froze over. And so, you know, my book is about the Anglo-American Northeast, about Algonquian speakers in present-day New England. But I think that's an area that scholars have researched pretty well, that New France had to adapt in all kinds of ways. And Native partners or neighbors where New France established that colony had to cope with really stark seasonal patterns of shipping and communication. You know, that's somewhat true in New England, but harbors rarely froze over for very long. So it's notable when harbors would freeze over in New England for a month or longer. There are far fewer ships that come across the Atlantic in wintertime, but people rely on intercolonial travel by boat and communication by boat in New England in a way I'm not sure was the case in New France. So that would be one difference. There's a lot of good comparative work. You know, Sam White's book, Cold Welcome, has a chapter on Quebec. I believe Dagmar de Groot and Colin Coates have published an article about winters in New France. And maybe most interesting to your listeners, Tina Adcock has aggregated a lot of recent blog posts on Canadian environmental histories of winter under the heading A Cold Kingdom so that people can think in a more sustained way 
about what the cold meant in 17th century New France, but also in more recent periods of Canadian history. Sarah asks, how did weather shape the religious practices and spirituality of both the Native Americans and the colonists who lived in New England? You know, that's a question that's so fascinating. It's a little hard to recover, but I could speak about it in a couple of ways. When you think about English settler religious practices, one way to measure kind of the public ceremonial religious life in English colonies in New England is to look at the days of public fasts and the days of Thanksgiving that are called. So scholars have kind of charted those over the 12 months. And they found that New England colonists had relatively few days of fasting in winter, although that did happen. And I mentioned the day of fasting to call for the great snow of 1717 to be over and to quote unquote, bless the springing of the year. That would be an example. But they had even fewer days of Thanksgiving in the winter after the more routine harvest feast that might have been as late as November. So in that way, there's a kind of gap in public ritual life, but it's filled in all kinds of interesting ways. So in 1693, Cotton Mather published a devotional guide that's almost 100 pages long. It's called Winter Meditations. That's by a colonist born in the region, for colonists living in the region. It's not a promotional narrative that's written by a traveler for a London audience. It's for how to live in an everyday cold environment for months at a time and how to gain spiritual insights from that cold landscape, how to deal with the reduced activity that often came. So that's really explicit. And I think the subtitle refers to instructions about how to employ your leisure time in winter, like how to make good use, make the best of winter time. I mentioned that there are a few publications that seem to promise that in the afterlife, there will be no winter. That certainly kind of confirms a general outlook among English settlers. By the same token, there are a few indications that maybe when some Wabanaki people talked about the afterlife, they imagined that winter would be there. And that also is consistent with a culture that embraced the good aspects of snowy landscapes. You know, there's really good work about Wabanaki religious life out there. And it's not something that I concentrate in great detail, partly because I think as your listeners know well, there's been good research about religious practices among Algonquian speakers of the Northeast as related to trapping and hunting and the proper treatment of animals that are considered kin. There's also really good research on Wabanaki Catholicism and the ways that Wabanakis took Catholicism with them as they traveled through the winter. When it comes to English missionary efforts, there's some evidence that English missionaries were limited in mobility in the wintertime in a way that Jesuit missionaries in present-day Maine and New Brunswick weren't. So there's some broad differences there. One of the things that interests me is that there are some suggestions that religious leaders or political leaders, you know, sagamores or sachems and shamans or other spiritual leaders among Wabanakis and other Algonquian speakers might have sometimes developed a reputation of being able to control the weather or predict the weather. But those indications are, you know, from the archival record are pretty slim. And to some extent, I treated the private religious life of families in wintertime is something that's to be respected at a distance that's hard to recover from the written sources. Now, lastly, I've spent about 35 winters in the present-day Northeast, and one of my mental tricks for making it through those really cold, really short days is to think about just how good I have it. I mean, I have modern clothing, I have electric lights that extend the length of my day, and my home is heated by natural gas, so I stay pretty warm. Early Americans and Native Americans in the early American Northeast, they didn't have those luxuries. So I'm curious about how Native Americans and early colonists in the Northeast dealt with those very short, very cold days and what those very short and very cold days must have meant for their relationship with night. So Tom, do you have any insight you can share with us? Yeah, that's a great question. And there are a couple of different ways to think about it. So 
One, you know, I agree. I'm very, you know, conscious that I'm, you know, sitting in a room that's heated by natural gas and, you know, I travel by combustion engine, you know, when I'm not walking in wintertime. And I think you use the word luxury. That is a luxury. And it's something that we could become more conscious of and maybe spend our energy a little more carefully. In another way, it's not a luxury. I mean, in the sense that like, there's a deficit that we accumulate by being restricted to indoor spaces and to vehicles that enclose us from the wider winter world. There's a lot that we don't understand if we don't spend a lot of time outside. And so, you know, there are opportunities to resensitize ourselves to winter in a way that might, you know, recover many of its pleasures in a way that acknowledges its challenges as well. And I think learning about how people before a period dominated by fossil fuel technologies, how they lived in wintertime, I think really might help us resensitize ourselves. And I think there are all kinds of possibilities in terms of public history. I mentioned Joyce Chaplin's recent article, The Other Revolution, that talks about the Industrial Revolution as being the watershed moment that separates early America from modern America. And, you know, one of the concepts there is that, you know, we might have a lot to learn from pre-industrial ways of life. You know, she asks whether there are ways to live ethically, live well, that can be learned from. And I think, you know, there's certainly examples in the early American Northeast of that. When it comes to nighttime in particular, there's the really long, long history of winter storytelling within indigenous communities between the first frost that could say marks the beginning of winter and the last frost that you could say marks the end among a lot of indigenous communities. And a lot of that winter storytelling goes on at nighttime, right? When people aren't outside being active. So in that sense, there's a, you know, even longer than the histories of universities in the Northeast that tend to have a, you know, September to May schedule. There's this, you know, millennia long tradition of cultural production and winter education on this continent that's centered around the colder months of the year and makes a good thing out of the fact that there's, you know, there are only seven or eight or nine hours of daylight. I also... In really practical ways, I uh, spent a lot of time thinking in one of my chapters about what it was like to navigate a colonial city at nighttime in the winter. Northern, icy, snowy cities on this continent you know, were, were a relatively new thing. If you think about the ways that colonists built cities by clearing so many trees and building cities often on juts of land or peninsulas or on the coast. And so certainly there were indigenous cities across the continent, Cahokia or Kankaskia, that had urban life in winter. But Boston created conditions that were somewhat challenging in the 17th century. Boston was windy, very icy. If you look at the diary of Samuel Sewell, he's constantly talking about the challenges of walking through the icy streets. At some point, he seems to have started wearing spikes on his shoes for traction. He rides his horse across the ice in the back bay and has to watch the ice conditions to make sure they're safe. He deals with snow drifts. He's trying to get his horse through in the wake of big snowstorms. He talks about the experience of snow fall, so falling snow beating on his eyes and making it hard for him to see as he's riding his horse. In positive terms, he talks about the great advantage that moonlight makes in the urban environment at a time when the streets weren't lit by public utilities. So, you know, I often tell students that, you know, the past is a foreign country. And I really think, you know, although I've spent a lot of time in Boston, and I think there are some really broad commonalities between people's experience in Boston in the 21st century and the experience of people who live there in the 17th century. 17th century Boston at night and wintertime was the whole different situation. And it was a new situation for indigenous people who were there too, attracted by the opportunities of the city, but also being subject to legal discrimination and being exposed by new ecological changes that made that space a kind of a dangerous and difficult space for native servants or even enslaved 
Wampanoags and Nipmucks and others who, especially after King Phil's War, navigated a pretty challenging urban space at nighttime in winter, if they were out at all. By the late 1600s, there were curfews that differentially applied to Native Americans and African Americans trying to control their nighttime movements. And that was probably a particular burden in wintertime when night was such a, a long period. So I don't know what adaptations you know, people like that made, what compromises urban residents worked out as they navigated those new forms of control that were being used against Native people. But, you know, in all these different ways, I think Boston was a tough place to be in wintertime at night. No matter what Cotton Mather says, and I think he comes up with all kinds of ways to get meaning and see the redeeming qualities of winter. It was a tough season, especially at night for people in that city. I can appreciate if you need to go warm up after that conversation. Now, if you enjoyed our short follow-up conversation with Tom, you might really enjoy our full-length conversation in episode 267. You'll find that episode and its show notes at benfranklinsworld.com slash 267. Thank you for being a subscriber and for supporting Ben Franklin's World. We really couldn't do this work without your help. Thank you so much. This episode of Ben Franklin's World is supported by an American Rescue Plan grant to the Omohundro Institute from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Jessica Brabble, Martha Howard, and Holly White. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation.